Who are we? Let us say together what's on the screen. I am created in the likeness and image of God. Therefore, whatever God is, I am. And this is the truth about me. This is who we are. And we can't change it. There's nothing we can do about it. We can ignore it or we can go with it and live with it. The topic today is in his name. How many of you have noticed like on communion tables and stuff in a lot of churches, they'll have that inscribed in there in his name uh, and sometimes on different pieces of uh, furniture within the sanctuary of a church. Uh, in his name means with his thought process, with his consciousness, with his understanding. Like when we pray at the end of the prayer, we say, in Jesus' name, amen. That means with his thought process, with the Christ consciousness. So in his name keeps us mindful of the fact that we need to be utilizing the Christ consciousness which the Bible very clearly says the same mind that was in Christ Jesus is also in us. We have the same mind. There is only one mind, and that is the mind of God. We all share in that one mind. In Lesson 154 in A Course in Miracles, it says, I am among the ministers of God. And it tells us, it says, let us today be neither arrogant nor falsely humble. We have gone beyond such foolishness. We cannot judge ourselves, nor need we do so. These are but attempts to hold decision off and to delay commitment to our function. It is not our part to judge our worth. When I read that in that lesson, it reminded me of a time, I think I told the Course in Miracles study group on Wednesday about this, but you all know that uh, I have a habit of when somebody says, how are you today? I says, perfect, just like you are. And I pulled into the bank teller window one day, and, and she says, how are you? And I said, perfect, just like you are. And she said, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm anything but perfect. Oh, no, I'm not. And I said, well, we're all created in the likeness and image of God, and we can't change. Oh, no, oh, no. And she started backing up from the window. I mean, it was distressful to her, really distressful to have that thought. Now, let me give you an opposite to that. I've probably told you all this before, too, but I'm going to tell it on Brittany. Brittany and I worked together at Cry Like Realtors, and the first time that I ever saw her or met her, we had a sales meeting, and uh, we all sit in this bullpen area, and next to me was an empty chair, and so she came in and sat in that chair and as she was sitting down uh, she said how are you and I said perfect just like you and my memory is still of her frozen halfway sitting down and stopping and she turned around and looked at me and she says I like that look at the difference between the reaction of two different people and then later she says, I want to know more about that. And I said, you can. So here she is. She knows more about it now. We never know what role is best for us, but there is one who does know the role who is best for us. Or what we can do within a larger plan, a lot of times we cannot see in its entirety. But there is one who can see in its entirety. That's the Holy Spirit, the higher self. Our part is cast in heaven, not in hell. Then the fair question would be, what's wrong with heaven? Why are we backing up like the teller at the bank did from who we really are and where we really reside? Where is heaven anyhow? Well, heaven is not a physical place. It's metaphysical, so that means it's in, within our awareness, in our consciousness, within our thought process. <clears throat> everything that's within our thought process, we have a choice here as to what we do with it. It's like we can choose to suffer if we want to. And some use the Bible to uh, justify their suffering because it says you're going to suffer. It's 
not the teachings of Jesus, but you can find that in the Old Testament. Depression is a choice also. It's our choice whether or not we want to be depressed. Because depression really is just a thought. Now that thought manifests itself in different things in our body and they can do tests and see that we're lacking in this or lacking in that. We throw our body out of kelter. But when we get put on the Christ thought process, the Christ mind, we balance everything out. Everything. Well, we're talking about heaven for that matter. Where's hell? Hell, likewise, is not a physical place. It's just a thought in our minds. It's a place to where we go to receive this tormenting and uh, I guess enjoy it. I don't know. I don't know what else they do in hell. One of the things I remind you of is uh, in heaven, this is why some people might not like heaven, Patty. There's no choice. There's no choice in heaven. Heaven is just as God is, just as you are, just as I am. There's no duality. There's nothing to choose between. Everything is ours. Everything. There is no choice. Likewise, there's no forgiveness in heaven. Boy, that's a bummer, isn't it? Why is there no forgiveness in heaven? There's no judgment. You are as God created you. There is no judgment. So if you want to shake somebody up, just tell them, say, God won't forgive you. There's no forgiveness needed. God knows us as God created us. 1 Corinthians, I'll remind you, says love keeps no record of wrongs. God is love. God keeps no record of wrongs. Happiness is our natural state. A lot of times somebody might say something bad about us or to us, and we get upset. So we lose our peace. We lose our peaceful state. We lose our happiness. Did they take it from us? No, we willingly gave it to them. We relinquished it by buying into whatever their story is. What are we really defending or protecting? What are we really defending? Well, we must see that we've been attacked to have to defend it. So we've got to make it real so that we can defend it. There's a saying, what you think of me is none of my business. That kind of straightens things out, doesn't it? How many times has some neighbor been mad at another neighbor and the neighbor that they were mad at didn't know they were mad at them? Everything was fine to them. So here again, it happens within you. It happens within you. When we take a defensive posture, we give up our happiness. Too often people demand proof. I had somebody this last week that uh, was asking me, well, how do you know that Jesus is the one that wrote the Course in Miracles? And I says, because I asked the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit answered me. Well, how do you know? See, we want proof. We want proof. And yet we take this, called the Bible, and in a lot of cases, we think everything in here is written by the laser finger of God. And we don't question that, well, other than me and you. But we don't question that. It reminds me of the saying, you remember, there's, I forgot the saying, um, it'll come to me. Y'all can help me on that. It's two ways of being wrong or two ways of being unhappy. Well, it's, it's where we believe that which isn't true. Two ways to be fooled. By believing that which isn't true. Now I'm on track. And uh, the other way is 
not believing what is true. And that way we're, we're fooled both times in both ways. <clears throat> Remember also in the Holy Spirit's realm, there is no time. No time. I've heard somebody tell me that, well, I asked the Holy Spirit and I hadn't gotten an answer. No. They said, and I didn't get an answer. I said, well, when was the time up? There's no time limit. There's time only in our realm here, and we block ourselves by that. You ask the Holy Spirit something, you will get an answer. I promise you. I didn't say when. I promise you, you will get an answer. He always answers. Remember that we're always teaching. Everything we do and everything we say is teaching others a little bit about you and a little bit about what your belief system is, a little bit about who you are. I remember for a period of time, like 20 years, I was single. And uh, then Monica came along and slammed the door on me, so that took care of that, thank you. Uh, but I really didn't seek somebody to date. And if I did encounter somebody to, to date or the possibility, all I wanted to do was to have a short conversation with them. I mean like a sentence. And that's usually about all it takes to find out who somebody is. Just let them talk for a little while. And they're going to teach you and tell you who they are and what they think and what they believe instantly. So we're always teaching, all of us, we're always teaching. The question is, what are you teaching? That's the question. What is your belief system? Which thought process do you listen to? Do you listen to the thought process of the Holy Spirit or, the, or Jesus? Or do you use the world's thought process? Do you buy into the soap opera called life and spread that? Which do you do? Whatever your appointed role may be, it was selected by the voice for God, which is the Holy Spirit or your higher self or the spiritual part of you or that part of you that was created in the likeness and image of God. Last Wednesday during our uh, Genesis presentation, at the end, everybody went around and was telling a little bit about what effect that had on them and what thoughts it brought up. And Donna Clayson was telling me, she says, I'm going to paraphrase you liberally here. Donna said, I always thought of the Holy Spirit as my higher self because it took it away from something that might be out here and it put it right here. My higher self, me, is always right here. So that's a good point and a good thing to think about if you're having trouble with this Holy Spirit idea. It's your higher self. That's the spiritual part of you that was created to the likeness and image of God. And it is as close to you as your breath. It is always with you, always there. And it's the Holy Spirit or your higher self's function to speak for you as well as for God. It sees your strengths exactly as they are and is equally aware of where they can be best applied and for what, to whom, and when. Your higher self accepts your part in this whole scheme of things for you. He does not work without your consent, but he's not deceived in what you are. He doesn't deny that you are created in the likeness and image. And he listens only to his voice in you. That brings it in closer. It's your higher self. It is through your higher self's ability to hear one voice, which is his own, that you become aware at last that there is only one voice in you. There's really not two. You choose to separate off and make it two. And that one voice appoints your function here. It relays it to you, giving you the strength to understand it and to do what it entails and to succeed in everything that you do that is related to whatever your function is. 
God never leaves his son. He gives us everything we need to accomplish what we're here for. God has joined with his son, the sonship, in this. And then the son, which is us, the sonship, becomes his messenger in unity with him. It is this joining through the voice for God of the Father and the Son that sets apart salvation from the world. It is his, it is this voice, which is his voice, which speaks of the laws that the world does not obey, which promises salvation from all error thinking, with guilt abolished in the mind that God created sinless. Now this man becomes aware again of who created it. We remember who we were created in the likeness and image of and of his last union with itself. Some time ago, Patty and I were talking about a message that I delivered. And I looked up something and this passage came open and I copied it and sent it to her. But this is true. Listen to this. This is out of that same lesson, 154. It says, A messenger is not the one who writes the message he delivers, nor does he question the right of him who does, nor ask why he has chosen those who will receive the message that he brings. Remember, Leona generally always reminds us that we're here for a reason. We have come wanting an answer to something. And she always reminds us, you will get it. It is enough that he accept it. Give it to the ones for whom it's intended and fulfill his role in its delivery. My job is to deliver. That's my only job. If I determine what the passage message should be or what the purpose is or where it should be carried, I am failing to perform my proper part as bringer of the word. All of that is directed by my higher self, the Holy Spirit. There's one major difference between the role of heaven's messengers, which sets them off from those that the world appoints. The message, messages that they deliver are intended for them first and it is only as they can accept them for themselves listen to what I'm saying here that they become able to bring them further and to give them everywhere that they were meant to be like earthly messengers they did not write the messages they bear but they become their first receivers in the truest sense receiving to prepare themselves to give You've heard it said that the teacher learns the most. The lesson is for the teacher. It's really what it is. An earthly messenger fulfilled his role by delivering and giving all his messages away. The messengers of God perform their part by their acceptance of his messages for themselves. And then show they understand the messages by then giving them away. And so they gain by every message that they give away. Would you receive the messages of God? For then you become his messenger and you are appointed now as a messenger of God. And yet we wait to give the messages a lot of times that we have received. And so we do not know that they are ours. We do not recognize them. No one can receive and understand that they have received it until they give it. You can't give it until you understand it. For in the giving is his own acceptance of what he received. Early on in my ministerial career um, I had a pastor of mine a minister of the church and uh, Reverend Gene Eford 
Gene's so smart, he doesn't know how smart he really is. But Gene would struggle on messages and, and sermons and stuff. And I say, Gene, my gosh, you know this stuff backwards and forwards and sideways and every way that there is. I said, won't you just get up there and give it? Well, he wanted to wait till he had it all down. He wanted to wait till he had the full understanding and, and that he could do that. Not me. I learned something new and I was excited. And brother, I'd preach it. I'd just get on with it. It was exciting to me to learn something and it light bulb moment within me. That's what I talked about the next week. Boy, I'd give it. But Gene knew more than I'll ever know from book learning. But I don't mind telling him and you. I could preach circles around him because I just gave it when I got it and understood it. But Gene really was a great guy and a good friend of mine. As a matter of fact, he's the one. Y'all have heard the story of how Monica and I got back together after about 20 years. Um, he was the guest minister at, at uh, Mount Pleasant United Methodist Church one day, Leona, and I rode my motorcycle over there. And the story is history now when Monica asked who's riding that beautiful motorcycle, so she chased me down. Also in A Course in Miracles, in lesson number 154, you who are now the messenger of God, receive his messages, for that is part of your appointed role. God has not failed to offer you what you need, nor has it been left unaccepted. Yet another part of your appointed task is yet to be accomplished. He who has received for you the messages of God would have them be received by you as well. For thus... Do you identify with him and claim your own inheritance? It is this joining that we undertake to recognize today, this very moment. We will not seek to keep our minds apart from him who speaks for us. For it is but our own voice we hear as we attend to that voice. He alone can speak to us and for us. Joining in one voice the getting and the giving of the understanding of God's word and the giving and receiving of his will for us. We practice giving him what he would have that we may recognize his gifts to us. He needs our voice that he may speak through us. He needs our hands to hold his messages and carry them to those whom he appoints. He needs our feet to bring us where he wills, that those who wait in misery may be at last delivered. And he needs our will united with his own, that we may be true receivers of the gifts that he gives. You have already been given everything in your creation. Last Wednesday when we were doing the Genesis seminar, it was very obvious that on the left-hand side of the board was the seven-day account of creation where everything was given us, everything. Nothing was withheld, no cost, no price, freely given to us. In Methodism, grace is defined as the free gift of God's love. And the main tenet of their belief is that we are a grace-filled people. And we are. We have been given everything. Everything that God is, we are. We will not recognize what we receive, though, until we give it. And you can't give it if you haven't received it yourself. You have heard this said a hundred ways, a hundred times, and yet belief is still lacking. But this is sure. Until belief is given to the fact that we have everything right now, you will receive a thousand miracles and then receive a thousand more, but will not know that God himself has left no gift other than what you already have. Nor has he ever denied the tiniest of blessings to us, his sons. 
What can this mean to us? When we have identified with him, we are his own. I am among the ministers of God. I am grateful that I, I have the means by which to recognize that I am free. And we can only realize and know that we have the means by which to recognize that we are free when we do this in his name, with his consciousness, with his understanding, with his thought process. The world and its effects on us grows dim as we light up our minds and realize that these words are true for us. They are the message sent to us today from our Creator. Now we demonstrate how they have changed our minds about ourselves and what our function is. For as we prove that we accept no will we do not share, our many gifts from our Creator will spring to our sight and leap into our hands, and we will recognize and know that we have received everything. And then... And only then we can give it away. For all of this, we give thanks in his name. Amen. It's time now for our offering. Let us repeat the offertory prayer. As I accept God's gift of everything to me, I now graciously share from my abundance and put into action the law of sharing and receiving. Let us join together now in uh, doing our closing song, and we're going to do that rectangle, remember? <laughs> 